This is lecture one of unit four, and what we're looking at are the um, economic changes that happened in the United States following the 1812 War. So we're looking in the 1820s, 30s, and 40s. Uh, this is known as the antebellum period, and antebellum just is Latin for before the war. Um, and so again, remember that because of the 1812 war, um, there were all these factories that had to be built because our trade was cut off uh, with the outside world. It's really going to kickstart our um, jump into the Industrial Revolution. Um, so in your, in your notes, one of the, the big reasons that we see this um, boom in industrialization, both in Great Britain um, and in the United States, is the influence of this book known as The Wealth of Nations. It's written by a gentleman named Adam Smith, portrayed here. Um, and The Wealth of Nations is to economics what Thomas Paine and common sense were to politics. Um, so Wealth of Nations presents this idea that capitalism um, is the superior economic system. And so this is a new idea. Before this, it had kind of been feudalism within monarchy, and um, it wasn't a, a nation's work capitalistic. This was kind of a, a new idea. And so again, Adam Smith, like Thomas Paine promoting democracy, Adam Smith is promoting capitalism. And this idea, again, he presents this right around when uh, the American Revolution is happening, and so it highly influences those groups of people who are also reading Thomas Paine. Um, and so this book is also being read in England and France, and it really starts driving this push towards industrialization um, and kind of free capitalism, free market capitalism. So um, before the market revolution happens, most of the United States, most Americans, um, were subsistence farmers. That meant that uh, whatever they needed, whatever food they needed, um, most products that they needed, they made for themselves. So they grew their own food, um, they made their own clothing, they may have purchased their own, their, purchased their shoes or they might have made their shoes, um, but generally if they needed it, uh, they, they made it. Most, a lot of Americans were living um, kind of on the frontier. Again, this is the average American. Um, but because of this revolution in our economic revolution that happens, we go through this market revolution where most Americans start producing for the market rather than for themselves. So they move away from subsistence towards um, whatever they are doing, whatever their job is, they are producing a product um, or a service to sell to someone else, to sell to the market. And that's why it's known as a market revolution. Um, so maybe they leave the farm and they go to uh, work in a factory or within their house, they're not really focused on farming, within their home they're actually making products to sell. Um, or if they're farming, maybe they are um, on a larger farm, if you think like a plantation for example, and they're producing goods to sell, um, so lots and lots of cash crops for example, rather than subsistence. So that's the before and after. Uh, and it's going to have both positive and negative impacts, and you'll see that in the simulation where some people really benefit from this revolution, um, but some people do not. Um, and so what we're going to look at is, again, some of those groups that are impacted by this. So first, why do we... Um, why? Um, and one was because of that book, um, and another reason was the 1812 war, but some things that are behind that that are helping facilitate that revolution um, is what is, is a system or a program that was started by the federal government called the American System. And this is invented by Henry Clay. And you're going to hear me talk about Henry Clay a lot in the next couple of lectures. He's a politician. He's all over the place um, do doing lots of really good things for the United States. But one thing that he does as a congressman um, is he gets approval for the American System. And this is federal funding for A, building of canals to help transportation and trade, B, it's federal funding for the construction of highways, highways that are actually good, and these horse and carriages can move faster on them. So they're not like our interstates, like I-85 today, um, but they're dirt roads that are going to be bigger, um, better, um, and, and constructed in a way that's going to have kind of, um, it's going to be improving uh, transportation so that it's not, they're not all bumpy and horse and carriages can go faster. Um, and it was also federal spending, it was also a protective tariff, and that's again a tax on imports, and you're going to see that come up a lot. The North loves taxes on imports because that means that people have to buy American produced goods in, in American factories. Um, the South, because they have to bring in so many manufactured goods, 
um, is not going to like these tariffs because they have to import so much stuff. So you're going to see that that causes some controversy. But again, the American system was supposed to um, give an incentive for Americans to buy American, and it was also supposed to improve trade and unite the entire United States in kind of one big economic um, kind of behemoth. Um, also at this time, the court case, the important court case, McCullough versus Maryland, is passed. Um, and this court case sets up that the federal government is going to be able to regulate things like interstate trade. Um, and essentially, McCullough versus Maryland is giving the United States government, the federal government, more power. Um, and that's really the takeaway from this, is that you see that the government is starting very slowly but surely to have more and more say and control and input into the economy, and before that, that was something that governments didn't necessarily do as much. Um, so again, you're going to see that slowly but surely as the decades progress, the, the government is going to have more and more say and control of our economy. Um, some of the inventions that drive this revolution, one um, is the invention of interchangeable parts, and this kind of seems like an odd thing because Today, if something breaks on something, say something breaks on your bicycle or your car um, or your computer, you can go out and buy a replacement part for that. Um, but this was not something that existed before, really, the antebellum period. Before, if you had a gun made or your shoes made, they were made, made by a skilled artisan and they were made by hand. So if something broke on your gun, for example, you needed to go out and that other skilled artisan needed to make at that moment a brand new part, or you needed to get a whole new gun or a whole new shoe or um, whatever it is that you needed um, fixed. Um, there wasn't, you couldn't just go by and replace that one part that was broken um, with kind of a standardized thing. But during this time period, when they start to invent um, sewing machines and guns and different products where um, everything is standardized so that you can just go out and buy a piece and again these pieces are made in factories rather than by skilled labor and you're going to see that this leads to a decrease in the number of skilled artisans and skilled laborers because things are being made by machines and they're standardized that way so it has both its benefits and its negatives. Um, the other thing is um, the use of whale oil and, and the whaling industry. Remember that part of the Treaty of Paris um, were those fishing rights up, up, up in Canada and a big part of that was whaling. So remember that oil, um, crude oil that we use today in machines and engines and things, that hasn't been discovered yet. And so the primary fuel for lights, for um, as lubricant in machines and all those different um, things that need to turn within machines, all of that is running on whale oil. And so it's really a critical resource um, that the United States needs to be to go into all these machines that are in the factories now, um, but also to lighting the factories to make workers work longer. Um, steam power also invented around this time. It comes from England, but the United States jumps on it. Um, and again, this is driving, um, we have steam-powered boats, we have steam-powered trains that come from this, and then steam-powered machines and factories. And then that last invention, the cotton gin. So it's an engine, um, and it was, um, the, the point of the cotton gin was actually to make the work of slaves easier, but what it in fact does is actually hurts um, slaves because it makes cotton so profitable that everyone in the South wants to start growing it. So remember that before this it was really rice and indigo and tobacco, but the cotton gin makes it so easy to process cotton so quickly um, that it actually reverses the trend of slavery. As, as the 1700s came to an end, the 1800s began, um, slavery was really kind of dying out even in the South. Remember that most of the North had abolished it, um, and the South was really realizing that it just wasn't a really good economic system. But the cotton gin turns all of that around. You'll see that slavery then spikes after the cotton gin um, is invented. And, but, and because of it, we see the textile industry boom in the North. So the North is definitely not innocent um, of the um, slavery practices in the South because the North factories needed the Southern um, slave economy to provide the cheap cotton for the textiles. Um, because we are going through this boom, this also leads to a boom, um, an economic boom, it leads to an immigration boom because um, 
particularly in, for people from Ireland and Scandinavia looking for jobs, excuse my dog, um, they are looking for jobs in all these factories that are booming, particularly in the north. And so you'll see in our activity in class that this isn't necessarily great for immigrants. So they come here looking for the land of opportunity, um, but in fact you'll see that there is this rising sense of nativism. Nativism is this anti-immigrant sentiment. Um, and so you'll see that throughout the 1800s, this gets harsher and harsher and harsher, and you'll see that some whole groups of people later on in the late 1800s are denied entry into the United States because of this extreme anti-immigrant feeling in the United States. So that's one group that's affected. We've talked about slaves, how they're negatively impacted. Immigrants are coming over in large amounts. And we also have women entering the workforce for the first time. Remember, they had kind of started in the revolution, but then kind of had to return to their normal roles um, when the men came home from the fight. But because of the introduction of the factory, um, you'll see that women start leaving the home really for the first time to work. Um, and it's usually in these textile mills. In the Lowell Mills in Massachusetts, you can see a picture here is, is um, one of the best examples um, of that. And you can see here a little girl. So it's generally young women, so um, girls from anywhere from 10 to usually early 20s. So they had to be single to work there. Um, but they start working and earning wages. Granted, those wages are, are less than men's. But again, it, it's women are finally earning money and bringing that back to the family um, and able to help provide for their families. Um, and you'll see again that this is both a blessing and a curse for the women who are actually working in these mills. Um, they are able to organize and start um, kind of sharing education and things like that. But um, So in general, um, the workforce, the way the, um, the workforce in general is impacted is that there are fewer and fewer skilled laborers, so they lose their jobs and end up having to become unskilled workers in these factories. And the, the impact of that um, is a greater division between, so the rich kind of get richer and the, and the poor get poorer, and you'll see this in the simulation we do in class, but the income gap gets bigger and we see a loss of skilled laborers, and that's going to be overall impact on the workforce. Um, one of the benefits of this, so we've looked at kind of the, the social impact, um, but one of the, the, the biggest impacts of this revolution is on transportation. And remember I said how the American system was Congress's plan to help um, kind of fuel this market revolution by easing, by making transportation faster and cheaper. And one of those ways was building canals, and the Erie Canal is the biggest example of this. And you can see how it connects uh, New York to the Great Lakes, and so it cuts down on the, the travel time, it makes it much faster and much cheaper. Um, the same is for the federal funding of highways, um, and then the railroads as well. So you see lots of federal funding going into railroads. And so if, again, at this time, steamboats are invented and used, that makes um, the transportation of goods for sale cheaper and faster, as do railroads. And so again, the impact um, is good. It does make um, products available to anyone, even if they're out in the west and on the frontier. Um, but you can see a picture here how um, the railroads, for example, the majority of them were built in the north. The same goes for the canals um, and the highways. And so while good and while easing the transportation, um, it does start to create two very different economic systems. In the north, one based on an industry and free labor, free labor meaning they're not enslaved, um, and again with much faster and cheaper transportation. And then in the south, an economy that stays stuck on cash crops um, and slave labor. And you'll see that to this day, this is why the South is still the poorest part of the nation, and the North is still much wealthier um, because of this economic division that starts at this time. And so that's as, and this, this is the last box, is that again, the North is, is industrializing and is getting much wealthier, and you'll see that the shift of power goes and then when we look at the video, the shift of power goes from New Orleans as the wealthiest and biggest port to New York City because of the Erie Canal. And so again, that economic powerhouse shifts in the United States and stays that way until this day. And like I said, the South stays focused on slavery and cash crops, 
um, and that's kind of a lasting impact. It's this slowly growing division between the North and the South economically, and how um, within several decades it will be such a stark difference that it's irreconcilable until without a civil war. And then finally we get a growing class division, whereas before it was most Americans were subsistence farmers and there was a small class of very wealthy landowners, now um, we see a few wealthy people getting much, much, much wealthier, um, but then the kind of the middle class shrinking because of the loss of the skilled laborers and the artisans and kind of a growing uh, lower class that is the unskilled laborers working in, in the factories. And that is it for today.